Hello ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another segment of Silent Voices. We want to thank you for tuning into the program today. Now for comments or suggestions on the show, please email us at miparentalrights at gmail.com or visit us at our social network at miparentalrights.com dot ning dot com. I will give you these addresses again at the end of the show. I'm Dr. Carol Kramer and I'm licensed in the state of Michigan as a classroom teacher, as a school social worker, a clinical social worker, and as a marriage and family counselor. As most professionals will tell you, whether they are a therapist, an attorney, they usually have a case that will haunt them throughout the years. Sometimes school teachers even have cases they specifically remember. I'm talking about a case where they feel that justice was not served. Today we're featuring one such case where I personally worked on this case with other uh, physicians, psychiatrists for 10 years ago. And today we have a young man with us who will, is uh, not identifying himself and protecting his identity uh, by using different names and protecting his family identity. This young man is a very courageous man and we're calling him John for the purpose of this interview. And so I'm going to start out by asking John, uh, why is it that he agreed to come here today to talk before the cameras and before all of you that are concerned with parental rights? John, why are you here today? I'm giving my sisters a voice because they haven't really had much say in the matters that have happened. Okay, you're concerned about your sisters and the fact that what happened and the very traumatic incident um, at your house, it really tore your whole family apart. Is that not true? It's true. Yes. Okay, so I'm going to, I know it's not easy to go back, but I'm going to go back with you and I'm going to show the audience um, a picture that you drew when your mother brought you in to see me very shortly after the uh, incident had occurred. And on this picture, what we see is a bed, a child, um, it looks like a child, a small stick figure on the bed, a small stick figure under the bed, a stick figure holding a knife standing at the end of the bed, and another stick figure over here in the corner where it says doorway. Now what happened when you drew this, I asked you to tell me what was going on. And as you told me what was going on, I wrote down these words. And you said to me, Annie, my youngest sister, tried to roll off the bed 
My stepdad tried to hold on to her. He still had the knife in his hand. My stepdad told her when she was running away, don't you tell or I'll go to jail. Annie was holding her bottom with her, and you held up your right hand, so I put the word right in parentheses. Then you went on to say there was blood on her hand. And my stepdad ran and got her and put her in the bathtub. She sat there crying in the bathtub. There was blood in the water. He went and cleaned up the bedroom. There were no bubbles in the water, just blood, and it scared me. When I bring back that scene that you shared with me, uh, why don't you share with the audience just how you feel when you hear that running back? How does that make you feel? Just sad and scared. It's just not something you really want to go back to and look at. Yeah, it makes you feel very sad. How about the term helpless? Does that, is that a part of it too? Yes. Yeah. Okay, yeah, and but in fact, the very fact that your next older sister went and got you and you came over back with her, that was a very brave thing to do. And that you witnessed it and that you were willing to tell me about it. Now you told me a little bit about what your stepdad said to Amy. Amy is a little stick figure that you pointed out that was under the bed. You told me at the time that she had come over there because she heard Annie crying and that she was yelling, help me, help me. And, what, and so your stepdad said, get out of here when he saw Amy go under the bed. He then put the knife um, between Annie's legs. Then he started to cut her, and she screamed and cried. And my stepdad said, stop it. And Annie put her legs together. Then he pulled her legs apart. And that knife in his hand, is that the knife that he used to cut Annie with? Then you told me that down there, under the bed, Amy said, in response to Annie's crying, help me, help me, I'll help you. And my stepdad said, get out of here. And Amy was crying under the bed. Fi finally, Annie ran out of the room. Um, and you just have yourself, and you said, that's me standing in the hallway looking through the doorway. And uh, so we had that drawing there. And then I have another drawing that I'd like you to take a look of, at. And this drawing is of a knife. And as you look at this drawing, do you recall this knife at all? Yes. Okay, and what can you tell me about the knife? Um, before this incident even happened, me and my sisters were going through our stepdad's crate of things he had from like the military, and we found a knife in there, and it was looked really similar to that one. Okay, and so it's not like you hadn't seen that knife before, and so you're saying it was something like the military may have given your dad? Yes. Or your stepdad. Okay. And so you kind of remember that. And that certainly does look to me like it was not your average bread and butter knife or table knife. It does look like a pretty sharp knife there. Now I have something else. And it was something written for, um, in response, I should say, to what had happened. And... I would like, it says at the top, 
This is a true story for me. And this was written in very childlike, probably first grade handwriting, kindergarten writing. And um, it says, my dad, he touched me. And, I'm, and as a school teacher, these, I'm reading it phonetically in my private part. And my sister and I think it's I sound, made a sound like st and opened the closet. And dad spanked her. And when he touched my private part, it hurt so bad I would cry and scream. Okay? And um, that was written by, I believe, by Annie. And then there's something written by you. And of course, this looks a whole lot more like um, perhaps second to third grade writing, being as I taught both grades. And it says this, I saw what my stepdad did to Annie, and it wasn't good at all. It was a terrible thing he did, and he shouldn't have done it at all. He also did something to me. He shouldn't have done anything to me or to Annie. And you signed it. And this was done, um, this letter, or these little notes here, were written um, in 2003. So I have those that I wanted to share. Now what I'd like to do is um, ask you, um, other than your stepdad, as you pointed out, touching you where he shouldn't have and doing some not good things to you, um, how did it go with your own mother that you were living with? How did she act towards you? Just loving and caring. It was a lot better with just her around. And me and my sisters loved her a lot. She was a really good mom. Okay. And so she was never mean or um, rude or disrespectful of you in any way? No, not at all. Okay. However, as I followed this case, John, um, something very interesting happened, and I believed personally that injustice was served. In fact, I would like to go and tell our audience that that picture that you drew for me, um, I called up the, it was called the FIA at the time, now it's the DHS, and I told them I had additional information to submit under the law as a therapist, and I told them what it was. And I think that it was going to be very interesting to the listening audience that they told me at the time, the intake uh, woman, we have enough information, we do not need additional information, do not send it. I could not believe that, so I asked to talk with her boss, the supervisor. The supervisor got on the phone and she said the same thing, we have all we want to know about that family. And I said, but it says if we have new or additional information. She said, don't send it. And I said, I'm going to send it because the law requires it. So I sent it in. However, it made no difference. And from what happened, the girls were sent to live, your sisters were sent to live with their birth father and you were sent to live with your birth father. Now, before you were sent to live with him, had you ever met him? Did you know him? No, not at all. I've never seen him before. You had never seen him before. So you had had no contact with him. How many times, do you recall at all, did they allow you to see him or introduce? Do you remember him to you? Um, no. Okay. But the next thing you know, you were living with your birth father. How did your birth father uh, treat you? What did he act like? Um, he didn't really show much affection. It was just, I don't know. It was <laughs> uh -huh. Just didn't really sh show like he cared that much at all. And I was just another kid. 
kind of like what? Your additional piece of furniture or your additional responsibility or? More like additional responsibility. Okay. All right. Okay. And how would he act? Did you have any brothers, stepbrothers, or sisters there, or half brothers or half sisters? I had two stepsisters, two little stepsisters. Mm hmm. And how did he act toward them? Well, we would go to like Cedar Point and stuff, and like as a family. And they got more attention than I did, but it didn't really mean much back then. Was it um, always positive attention, or did he sometimes say not so nice things to one of the girls? Uh, my older sister, Katie, like later on after the years went by, he would like say really mean things to her, just about, like, about her weight and stuff. And what would she do when he said those kinds of things to her? She would just cry and go in her room. And okay. we wouldn't see her. Um, what happened at Christmas? How did he ha how did he handle the Christmas present? Well, anything that he paid for was his. Even if he gave it to you as a gift, he could take it back and say it was his because he paid for it. Everything was his. What might have been one of the gifts that he gave you? Do you recall any? Uh, like, like a cell phone or an Xbox or just anything. Okay. So let's take the cell phone or the Xbox. He would just take it back? He would just take it and say, it's mine. I paid for it. You can't do anything about it. Wow. Would you ever see it again? I eventually got it back. Was he doing that to try to discipline you, to punish you? I guess so. But if it was to punish you, were you aware of what it was for, even while you were getting punished? Uh, not usually, just little things that are blown out of proportion. Mm hmm You must have missed your mother a lot during those times. Oh, yeah. Did you get to see your mother very much? Uh, we had visits for like a f couple of years. I mean, I get to see her like once, like a week. You could see her once a week? Yes. How did you look forward to that? I mean, was it pretty exciting? Did you really look forward to it? Yeah, it was always a good time because I get to see my sisters again too, and then we'd just get be together again. Okay. <clears throat> um, now, did you stay uh, with? Because you're now 18, so that's why you can talk freely here. Now, did you stay with this um, birth father of yours? Until you were 18? No, at the end of the summer of my junior year, when I was 17, I packed up everything and just left and moved in with my friend in an apartment. And that's where I stayed. Wow. What did your dad say about you moving out? I didn't talk to him. I didn't talk to him once after that. Did he even say my child has disappeared and called the cops or anything? No. Did he know where you were? You eventually found out. How long was that before he found out? Um, they found out the same night that I did leave. They kept calling my phone and stuff, and they eventually found out that I was not coming home. Okay, so they kept calling your phone that same night when you didn't appear, when you had moved out? Yes. <clears throat> and finally you told them, you answered your phone and you said, I've moved out? Yes. And what did your father say then? I don't know, I didn't talk to him. I talked to my stepmom the whole time and she was really worried about me, but my dad didn't say anything. You know, it makes me wonder um, how you would feel about the courts approving of any child who had not seen his birth father since birth being put in with that birth father and having to live with that birth father and finally finding it so unbearable he has to move out. Mm -hmm. What would you feel, what would you say to anyone about that? 
it was just stupid how it all worked out. And eventually living there over the years just got to me and I just left. Would you say that you were sad most of the time? Yeah, it's sad. And then whenever, I, whenever it was possible, I was always gone away from the house as much as I could. I can understand that completely. When you needed money, obviously they were getting money in for support from your mother. Um, tell me a little bit about that. Did they give you an allowance or anything? Uh, I had an allowance once when I was like 10 or 11, but then that went away. And I just eventually had to get my own job to get anything. So if you, so the gifts were given you at Christmas, but could be taken away, because your dad said he bought them, they were his. Yes, yeah, so it wasn't technically mine. Okay, so they weren't really yours. And uh, as for your spending money, you got a job. Where does a young guy like you get a job? Fast food. Fast food. And you were there? And you have a lot of fun at your fast food job? Yeah, it was kind of like a second family. Uh-huh. So in many ways, it was a good feeling that you were able to go out and kind of make it on your own and not have to rely on a father that you felt really didn't care much about you in the first place. Yes. Okay. All right. Okay. Well, um, is there anything else that you would like to share? With, um, with the people that are hearing this interview and are listening? Um, is there any advice you'd like to give kids that are going through this? Uh, what would you like to say yet? Um, I'll just leave, live for each day, I live for the moment, and just everything will eventually work itself out and get better for you. Okay, did you, I gotta ask you something. Did a young guy like you, who was just so abandoned in a way, um, did you ever feel suicidal? Yeah. How did you handle that? I'd go and hang out with my friends. Because <laughs> through the years, since I, since I moved there, I always had friends that I could always go to. And my friends became my family. Wow. And it was one of those friends whose parents took you in. Yes. Okay. So you were not in an apartment with your friends the whole time? No. Okay. And so when you moved out, you said, how old were you again? How old did you say? Seventeen. Seventeen. And how long were you in that apartment? And then how long were you with your friend's parents? Um, I was in the apartment for like over a month. And then by the, end, the, by the time school started, I needed to get into like a better spot where I could be able to get to school on time and mm -hmm. so then I moved with my friend like right before the start of the school year. You know I'm just very impressed with the fact that with all this turmoil, all these feelings of abandonment, all these grief issues, that through it all you were able to stay in school. That's really to your credit. And so uh, what I'd like to say is I would like to thank you for being here. I'd like to um, tell the audience that they are free to contact um, my miparentalrights.org and to um, send any comments or questions or even encouragement, thanking you for being on the show and thanking you um, for helping them because I think there may be some young kids that are out there and in fact it's even possible that your young sisters might see this show and if they do it must be it might be very encouraging to them to know how much you love them that you're willing to go on TV in an attempt to try to get them back to where you can have a relationship with them and back into what you consider your family because today uh, you're living back with your mother. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. And how do you like that? Uh, we're in the middle of nowhere but it's still a good place to be. It's safe and feel secure. That's yeah. great. Well John thanks for coming in. I really appreciate it. I know how 
frightening it was for you to get on TV, and um, you've been a very special guest. And once again, thank you very much. Before we close the show tonight, I have a very special request from John. John, the courageous young man who came forward to help his sisters or to try to help his sisters. If there's anyone out there that is viewing this that can send any kind of help or give any kind of help to John who is fighting for his sisters, a young man who observed the physical sexual abuse of his sisters, who even drew a picture of it, who told his truth, who comes back 10 years later uh, from having been banished out of that home and still trying to help his sisters, we'd like to ask you, would you come forward to miparentalrights.org and help. Um, maybe you know of someone, maybe you have a friend who is an attorney, maybe you know of someone in, crystal, uh, in uh, criminal justice, maybe you know of someone who just knows another way that this young man can go to help his sisters. I'm gonna ask you to personally contact miparentalrights.org and I'm going to ask you sincerely to offer any help you can give them. They're a very courageous organization. They're fighting for parents. They're fighting for young people like John. And most of all, folks, they're depending on you. Thank you so much for tuning in. And we hope to see you again soon on another segment of, of MI Parental Rights. Thank you.